Kennedy, principal of uh, Delhi Public School, and Ms. Uh, Sagal, headmistress of uh, EPS, and the students of uh, EPS RK Purim and EPS uh, Shiksa Kendra. Bonjour, namaste, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the honor of being the, uh, the head guest today. And I have to, uh, before launching into something more formal, make a few comments about what the principal said. Uh, first, uh, I did my undergraduate degree in phys ed, so <laughs> whenever I talk about diplomacy, people look at me and say, uh, you have an undergraduate degree in phys ed, you didn't have something in international politics or economics or whatever. And I said, no, and I'm very happy uh, I did what I did because, as the principal rightly said, uh, if you do a, a degree in physical and health education, uh, you learn a, a couple of things. Yes, you learn about sports and you learn about health, which is all very important to your own physical well-being, but you also learn how to deal with people. And I think one of the benefits, whether it's in, in the context of diplomacy or even working in an environment with an awful lot of people, you have to understand what are individual strengths and how those individual strengths merge together to become a greater sum of the individual parts. And I think having that type of background has been very beneficial for me, and I'm sure looking at all the success that the school has had has been very beneficial for the principal as well. Uh, and I, I look back uh, you know, on my career, and uh, we had our, what, what would it have been, 35th uh, reunion in my class in 1975, not too long ago, and well, two years ago to be exact. And um, I look at all my colleagues, because doing an undergraduate degree in phys ed, it's training you to become a teacher. Uh, and most of my class, there's only two or three of us who did something other than teaching, uh, became teachers. Uh, and you know, we're very lucky in Canada, we have a wonderful education system. Uh, most in the phys ed classes ended up becoming principals for whatever reason. Uh, and they've all retired and are playing golf. And so I'm wondering, what am I doing now? If I should have stayed and been a teacher, I would have been enjoying my later part of my life in a much different way. Basketball. Now, uh, I play basketball once a week on Saturday afternoon. Sometimes we play twice a week, but Saturday afternoons I play with up to 12 uh, Indian friends. Okay, we play at the official residence. Uh, we usually play for a couple of hours. And I'm always accused of being the most aggressive person on the, on the court. But after watching what the principal has been saying, what he does, I have a funny feeling he's pretty aggressive as well. And, um, and uh, it's been a lot of fun because not only do we have, I mean, the bas basketball is an excuse to sit around and have a beer afterwards and discuss politics and what's going on in India. And that, for me, is always a, a very beneficial situation because you can read only so much in the newspapers. It's what people tell you that makes a, a big difference between uh, 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 what's the real facts and uh, what you read in the newspaper. Um, the other thing about being on time, in fact, I sat at the light at the, uh, at the ring road for 10 minutes, and most Canadians like to be 5 to 10 minutes early, not to be right on time. So it's a bit unusual uh, principle, but that was just a function of traffic in Delhi. So I think if you have children who go to uh, Canada, I think you'll find that time is an important factor, but you don't always have to be 5 to 10 minutes early. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and. Uh, I have to say that the speech I was given uh, was a good speech, but it was a bit too much about uh, why you should be sending your kids to Canada. And I wanted to talk more about why you should be sending your kids to school and what school is all about. And if you think Canada is a good place to send your kids afterwards, then all, you know, all the better. But more importantly, I think it's understanding what, um, what school is all about. So Canada's association with Delhi Public School goes back a long way. <coughs> And today is a very special day, as we know, as you celebrate the Scholar Badge Function to recognize outstanding achievements, not only in academics, but also in other important areas such as sports, music, art, and dance. And you have some incredible, incredibly good students and children. Now, I always enjoy speaking to students because I feel young at heart myself, and I'm blessed with three uh, wonderful sons. One who has uh, recently graduated from university in Canada, one who's finishing his final year at university, the same one, which happened to be the university I went to, and my youngest who is in uh, grade eight here at uh, the American Embassy School. I'll talk to you today a little bit about Canada and India, perhaps not in a traditional way, as I said, about promoting our country as an, as an education destination, but more in how our country, countries, know in fact our people share similar values. We're here to celebrate the success of DPS students across the spectrum of activities undertaken by the school. 
and there are a number of proud parents attending this event, many of whom have sacrificed a lot to have their children attend this august institution. This is no different for parents in Canada, where education is a priority, and as a country, we are blessed with an excellent educational system at all levels. Those students who have won badges today should be rightly proud, as should their parents. But even those of you who have not won a badge, you have been given a wonderful opportunity to get a first class education and the chance, uh, and the chance to win different badges of your own as you move through life. These badges may not be material in nature, they may come in a variety of forms, the smile of a parent, the glow of respect of an admiring child, or the praise from a friend and colleague. These badges have and will come because you have been true to the values instilled in you by your parents. They have been awarded because you have risen to meet the challenges presented by your teachers and those of this wonderful and complicated country. These badges come because you have been blessed with an opportunity so many others don't have in India. As India reemerges as one of the world's great economic and social powers, India will need you, the students, its youth, to help this great country realize its full potential for economic growth and development. Even though Canada and India are separated by distance, we are close in terms of shared values of a strong democratic tradition, a pluralistic society, a respect for the rule of law, and an understanding of the need for tolerance and communal harmony. It's no wonder the number of Indian students in Canada has increased fourfold from 3,000 in 2008 to over 12,000 in 2011. Because Indian parents and students understand that Canada is a safe and welcoming environment for study. The quality of the education is world class and at an affordable cost. And our language and values are similar. Our Prime Minister, uh, Stephen Harper was in India just a few weeks ago to reinforce the important relationship between our two countries. He himself has two children, the same age as many of you in this room. He and Prime Minister Singh talked about common values, respect for the individual, the need for mutual economic development, and the importance of education in solving global and local problems. All of you here will have different choices uh, to continue your education. Many will stay in India, and many will go abroad. All of you will have the responsibility, whether home and abroad, to contribute to the future of this great country. It's a big responsibility, but one I know you can assume. Why? Because you have the support of your parents and the strength of the values they have instilled in you. Now I'd like to share a happy and proud moment for me. It's about a badge I personally awarded my oldest son this week. Uh, Alex uh, graduated two years ago from a good Canadian university with a, a degree in mechanical engineering. He works for a clean technology company located in Vancouver, a company that provides the technology that allows diesel engines to run on compressed natural gas. In fact, most of the buses in Delhi have engines that use this company's technology. Currently, he's in India working on two projects. Uh, but one is truly fascinating. Uh, two nights ago, I hosted a small dinner uh, for the dean of a Canadian business school, my business school, uh, and my son was in included. He started to describe the project, uh, one that involves a commitment uh, for the Clinton Global Initiative. For those of you who don't know uh, of the Clinton Global Initiative, it was established in 2005 by former President Bill Clinton. And the Clinton Global Initiative convenes global leaders to create and implement innovative, uh, innovative solutions to the world's most pressing challenges. Now the challenge Alex's company has undertaken is to develop an engine that will uh, replace diesel with gas from bio waste for generating sets needed to run cell phone towers in rural India. The goal for the engine is not to only provide <clears throat> power for the cell phone tower, but to provide power for the rural village community. To put this into perspective, diesel generating sets for cell phone towers in India consumes 3 billion liters 
of diesel fuel a year. More fuel than consumed by Indian railways. There are 40,000 villages uh, in India without power, and those homes uh, in India with power have it at intermittent times for six to eight hours a day. So listening to my 23-year-old describe the challenge to the Dean of the School of Business, with a degree of enthusiasm and a depth of knowledge I didn't know he had, astounded me. He wants to make people's lives better. He wants to make a difference. Not necessarily to make money, but he knows what the right thing is to do. I see in this the value of his parents, the realization of the value of a good education, and the understanding of his role in making the world a better place to live. My smile of uh, pride was the badge he received without even knowing he had it. I know many of you will be doing the same thing for your parents as you make your mark in the school and in the world. I'm very proud of our educational system in Canada, one that builds the capacity of our young people to understand and solve complex problems facing the world. Whether these problems are of a technical nature or social, I know we have the universities that can meet the challenges. If you as students decide Canada is the best place for you, I know you won't be, I won't, uh, you won't be disappointed. Thank you for having me here today, and I wanted to leave some time for some questions so that we can get into uh, a little bit more detail if you're interested about Canada uh, as a place for education, but more importantly, the relationship between Canada and India, and Canada and India and the world. So thank you very much. And just to reiterate the, the slogan, two things I probably want to reiterate. One is, uh, the, the, uh, I think the uh, motto on your, on your crest is appropriate, so it's service before self. And the second thing is, when people are making quotes here, one I'd like to quote is B.B. King. He said, the beautiful thing about education is no one can ever take it away from you. Anyway. Is it cold in Canada? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in the did you enjoy listening to B.B. King? I love B.B. King. I love all jazz. So, uh, you know, uh, John Coltrane, uh, Miles Davis, you name it. Uh, it's fantastic. That's an easy question. Next one. Maybe I should start asking you questions. What's the population of Canada? Well, I'll answer that question. Uh, it's, the sec it's the second largest country in the world, geographically speaking. It's got the population of uh, uh, Greater Delhi, 33 million people. Uh, we have uh, the best uh, economy right now uh, at the G7, and we have three of the top five cities in the world in the uh, livability index, right? Uh, and if you're talking about universities, when the, when the principal was talking about the, uh, the student who's been so successful, and he says, well, she's getting uh, full scholarships to Harvard and to Yale and to other uni uh, American universities, we have some of the best universities globally in Canada, University of Toronto, University of British Columbia, University of Alberta, uni uh, University of Montreal, McGill, uh, Queens. There are a number of Canadian universities, and my hope is that when he talks next year with the next chief guest, he'll add one or two Canadian <laughs> universities in that uh, in that conversation. So that's that's important. Um, the other thing that about Canada right now, which people don't realize, well, I mean maybe some people do, is that we are sitting on the third largest uh, deposits of, uh, of oil uh, in the world. Um, again, for a population of 33 million people, we have more than enough natural resources when it comes to oil and gas to export. Uh, to places like India, and that's a pri priority for us. Uh, and um, uh, again, uh, we uh, did not have one bank that failed uh, in the 2008 financial crisis. So as a banking system, well, again, we've been rated by the World Economic Forum as having the bank, best banking system in the world. So besides having a pretty good economy, uh, the only thing that would be, I guess, a negative in some people's eyes is that it gets cold in the wintertime. But as the principal knows, in the summer it's quite nice. And uh, we're very blessed to have a beautiful country with lots of different things to do. So. Yes? 
So whenever I talk to my friends, I hear them telling me about uh, like they want to go to US after they uh, pass out from the school. But I've never, I've never heard anybody talk about Canada. How do you feel relations can be improved between the two countries? Uh, between Canada and India? Yes. Uh, I think, again, just to talk a little bit about Canada and India. Um, after, and this, this was part of the conversation that we had uh, between the two prime ministers. Uh, India took a look at a lot of different constitutions uh, in 1947 to decide on which con constitution that they would have. And the one that they chose and, and emulated to a large degree was the Canadian constitution. Um, so we started off with a very good relationship. Uh, and so our prime minister at the time and prime minister uh, Nehru were very close and, and we shared and we were in some ways a, a mentor. And our relationship developed quite well to the point that we sold you uh, our nuclear reactor technology uh, in the 60s. Uh, and then, of course, India exploded a bomb in the 70s. And that really, because again, Canadian plutonium was used in that process. And that really put a chill in our relationship for about 10 years. And just as it was coming out of its, of its uh, darkness, so to speak, uh, we had the Air India Act uh, terrorist attack uh, in 1984. And that put the pall again on our relationship around Palestinian issues and such like. Just as it was coming out, uh, Pokrim too, uh, in 98. So we've had a really up and down relationship uh, in terms of trust and friendship. Uh, and the friendship has always been there, the issue around trust. And, and our current prime minister uh, has been really focused on building the relationship back with India. We have a large Indian diaspora in Canada, as many people know. We have. 3% of our population is the largest diaspora per capita uh, uh, of Indians, uh, for Indians in the world. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, we really focused on changing things. 2010, we signed a nuclear cooperation agreement that buried a lot of uh, the history that we had on the nuclear side. And then just in the last visit, we signed the administrative arrangements for that. So essentially, we're back to an even keel, I think put a lot behind us a lot of that trust. So. The relationship between our two countries is good. Why people go to the United States first over Canada is uh, for the same reason I think that you know we live next to the United States. Our life is dictated by the United States. It is our biggest trading partner. I mean, it was when I first started in this business, 86% of our exports went to the United States. A billion dollars a day of trade goes back and forth across the border. So we're fixated on the US. And it's hard for us to look beyond the borders of North America to China, to India, to the emerging markets. So it's understandable because the US has got such a big presence, and of course the UK historically here as well. For us, we've gone, we've moved up in terms of education, for example, from being fourth and fifth place now up to third place in terms of an education destination for Indians. But that's important. I mean, we've changed an awful lot. And the good news is we have about 30,000 Indian students in Canada right now. When they come back, I'm confident they've all had a good experience. I'm confident that they will come back and tell kids here, it's a good place to go to school. Wear your mittens in the wintertime, but it's a good place to go to school. And uh, you know, they and you have a, a a very friendly, tolerant environment in which to support you when you. And, and that's so important for parents that to know that they can send their kids to Toronto, which is a big multicultural city, and that it's safe to walk the streets at night. It's a good place to go and have a and. Uh, and understand and to get an education, whether it's Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, all the big cities in Canada, it's a safe place to go. So that's, that's I think, will change. And, I, and I'm hoping that in the next five years, we'll see those numbers even increase more than, than what we currently have. Yeah. Can I just add something here? Um, I think it's important to I went to US uh, for my master's and PhD and lived there for a long time. But I had friends from my institute, IIT, went to Canada as well and they're still living there and it's a beautiful country, I'll tell you that. Education system, if you compare to US and Canada, it's pretty much the same now. They're very good and there's no doubt about it. Well, thank you very much. That makes it easier for me. That's my job. And I have to tell you, my, uh, my wife is a Stanford grad, okay, so it's always a bit of a struggle uh, when, we, when it comes to uh, our children. But our children wanted to stay in Canada and go to school. Or, you know, their friends were there and things like that, but still, you know, they felt that they could get the same type of education uh, as going to school in the United States, even though Palo Alto is a pretty nice place to live. Yeah.
everybody. I'm Dr. Monica Kazuri. I'm a pride, uh, I'm a very proud uh, product of the school only. And I'm into education industry. And as you mentioned, that sometimes we want to do the business just for the sake of, not for the sake of business, but want to make a change. So one thing which I'm facing when I'm uh, recruiting students is the scholarship programs. So my suggestion and my request would be like in with whatever way is possible, how do we increase the uh, percentage of scholarship program. There are many students in India who are eligible, but uh, I tell you very frankly that uh, it, uh, finances are, is a main concern here. No, and I, yeah. I, we understand yeah. completely, and that's one of the things that we've been raising with the Canadian University system. That, you know, the, the quality of the students here in India is so very, very high. And many now, I've just in the last, uh, last year, a consortium of schools put together a bigger program uh, for scholarship funding for Indian students. And I think that's all very positive. Uh, but also, I should say at the same time, for, for people who, you know, are middle income, upper middle income uh, Indians, you can send your kids to Canada at, a, at a, an affordable price. So, you know, if we wanted to send our son to, uh, to Stanford, for example, that would, to be honest with you, was another factor in the equation. Uh, it would have cost probably close to eighty thousand uh, dollars to do that. Uh, to send him to Queens, it cost us. Now we're a Canadian. But it cost uh, us less than twenty thousand dollars. Was less than what it cost us to send them to private school in Ottawa. So, for an, Indi an Indian, it would cost you a little bit more, but not that much more. So, you, there is a big differential in the cost between quality institutions in Canada and quality institutions in the United States. Yeah. Maybe a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, I'm mindful of the principal's time limits here. Yeah. Um, this question about your mind uh, yes, we did, and we had troops there for, uh, we don't right now, uh, we have 900 uh, officials, uh, when I say officials, military and police officials left in Afghanistan uh, to uh, help with training uh, the police forces and the, and the Afghan military. Uh, we have spent, we spent 10 years, we close to 160,000 Canadians, 160 Canadians, 160 Canadians were killed in Afghanistan. Uh, we had 3,000 troops uh, fighting in the most difficult part uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, we pulled out in 2011, uh, the, the fighting uh, complement in 2011. Uh, but it's still our largest aid destination. We put over a billion dollars into Afghanistan, very similar to what India has done, quite frankly. And it's been a, it's been a priority for this government and the government before that um, in terms of trying to solve the issues that, that are there. And there are many things that we're trying to do uh, that are non-military in nature that will uh, improve the lot of the people in Afghanistan. Yes. <coughs> yes, you can do double majors uh, in Canada as well. Pardon me? Well, French uh, is you know it, you can go to French universities, uh, but you can also go to uh, English universities in Quebec and do both, English and French. Uh, you can take French programs and, you know, French, uh, there are, there's a French curriculum in most of the universities in Canada. And if you went to the University of Ottawa, for example, you could do uh, it bilingually, English and French. So it's not, a man it's not a mandatory requirement. It depends on the university and what, what, your, uh, what your child would like to do. So it's very easy, as you can imagine, to, to learn French and to have a French curriculum. Yes? Uh, so I'm also like an ex dipside and it uh, feels really proud to be back here. Uh, but sir, my question to you is not really about uh, the uh, how to improve India and Canada relations or something like that. I'm sure that that's on an uphill track. I have a lot of friends who are in Canada, really happy there. They're going to come back and get these students convinced. But my question is to do with your experiences in other countries. So I believe you had a stint in Shanghai during your uh, work career. So how do you think, I mean, how do you compare our system with the other Asian countries? And where do you see us as a country in terms of its education system heading in the next four or five years? Do you see it coming far, uh, to the Canadian institutes? Can we see Canadians actually coming to India to study here instead of us going there to Canada? That's okay, well, there's a couple of parts to that question. Um, in terms, I can't speak to all of Asia, but I can speak to China, okay? And, I can talk a little bit about the relationship between, I mean, uh, the differences between China and India uh, on a macro level. And I just wrote a little piece to go back to Ottawa that actually was a, it was a cover to an op-ed that was in uh, 
uh, one of the newspapers here this week. And I, I honestly believe that uh, India is about 10 years behind China in its economic development. In some cases, probably uh, you know, on a social side, even further uh, behind, uh, behind China. So there's a lot of catching up that has to be done. But there are problems you know, uh, politically from an Indian context that, to get there because of the, you know, the fact that you're a democracy, which is good. Okay? I mean, uh, when you live in, in Shanghai and you see development happen over a four-year period, you're just totally amazed at how successful the country has been. I mean, Ivy was in, in Beijing, I was in Shanghai, and a lot of people actually in our office have gone through the China experience. And so we, we know and understand uh, you know, sort of the differences and the frustrations that exist. Uh, I think we get things done in China. We, it takes a little bit longer to get things done here in India. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't move up quickly. And I think the changes that you're beginning to see in India will create that type of momentum if we get out of the political kind of, I mean, you don't always have to work at the central government level. You work at different levels and you can, you can see some success. On the education level, I have to tell you, what, what I see in China and what I see in India is very much the same. The dedication of parents to their kids' education is phenomenal. The, the willingness to spend the money to have the best education for their child, doesn't matter what, what income level they are, it's, it's absolutely astounding. And if you take a look at, I mean, we, we're, we're very pleased with the growth in our uh, education numbers from India, but the Chinese have found Canada a long time ago, okay? And so our numbers out of China are way larger than they are out of India because they understand the type of society and the type of education that they can get in Canada. So, yes, I mean, from that perspective, now when it comes to Canadian educational institutions coming to India, we probably have, how many now, um, memorandums of understanding, over 200 of them, I think. Over 200 between Canadian educational institutions and Indian educational institutions. And you have to understand one thing um, about how it works in Canada. Of course, we have uh, uh, primary school, secondary school, and then after that, you can go either into the higher education, university level schooling, or into voca the vocational institutes. And that's what we see missing here in, in, in India, is the ability to train those people who are essential to a workforce, but that vocational institute uh, avail availability is quite low. Whereas in Canada, everybody has that choice. And you'll find a lot of uh, students who are going through social programs, you know, when I say social programs, but, you know, like BA, uh, Bachelor of Arts, or, or whatever, they end up going into uh, a technical college afterwards to get some degrees that will find, that will prepare them better for the workforce, and so and that's why you're seeing some really interesting things coming out. So you have these people with would have a fine arts degree, then going into a digital media program at one of the uh, at one of the vocational institutes and coming out and becoming hired instantly to work in publishing houses, you know, the big ones doing animation studios. So if you take a look at a lot of the films, for example, that are coming out with with heavy animation or heavy uh, 3D effects. A lot of that's being done in Canada because they find people with, you know, a, a broader uh, basis of, uh, of background. So what we're working on, one area that we're working on, is to bring more vocational Canadian vocational institutions to India to help build that capacity here, which I think is one that's sorely needed and will and will produce tremendous benefit from an economic uh, development perspective for the country. So that's that's where we're that's where we're going, but. We've also, the government, because of the importance on India, has just put $15 million into a center, um, a Canada India Center for Research Excellence. Again, with the goal of bringing scientists um, and universities together uh, to uh, challenge, you know, to uh, take on some of the bigger challenges that we're facing in, in, in the global environment. And one area in, in particular where we have tremendous global strength from a Canadian perspective is, uh, is water. Yes. So after everything being said and done, where do you see India right now, and where do you see India after 10 years? In 10 years. Okay, where do I see India right now? I'll go back to what I said. It's, it's 10 years behind China, okay, uh, in terms of a lot of uh, the economic indicators. And I think within 10 years it'll be, uh, unless, unless there is, from a political perspective, you know, um, you know, more and longer policy paralysis, I think uh, it, India can catch up quite quickly to China. It may not be at the same level within 10 years in terms of the economic growth uh, dimensions, but it'll be very much higher up the curve. And quite frankly, if it isn't, okay, India is going to have a real challenge because you have so many young people entering the workforce 
that if you don't have that type of economic development, it's going to not be a demographic dividend, it's going to be a demographic disaster. So we need to work, you know, as a, you know, collectively, whether it's Canada or the United States or uh, Australia or other countries that are, are that are more developed, to work with India to bring that economic development agenda to the front and to look at investment in infrastructure and other areas, education of course, these are all key and critical things. And if I was to give you my soundbite on the Canada-India relationship, there's four areas that we really are focusing on. Food security, energy security, education, infrastructure. Those are the four areas that are critical and where we believe that we can add value uh, in the economic growth of, uh, of India. One, yeah, one, more one last question, sir. Uh, sir, you have been talking about the relationship between India and Canada, and you said that we need to work collectively. But the thing I want to ask you is that are children from Canada being encouraged to study in India? Yeah, so well, we have good that was part of that question that you asked. I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was uh, uh, when we had the dinner that I was talking about with, with my son who was there, uh, the dean of the, of the School of Business of, from Queens was here looking at uh, developing the relationships with. Uh, Delhi University uh, and others, okay, where they would have a, an exchange program with students, uh, where the students would come here for uh, four to six months uh, and, and be doing part of their academic program. They have these programs around the world. I'll leave it there. And thank you very much uh, for allowing me a chance to, uh, to say a few words uh, today. Thank you.